When it comes to solving Rubik's Cubes, I'm really terrible at it. So I set out to build a Rubik's Cube that will solve itself. My name is Zach and here on Bite Size Engineering, I make ridiculous projects like this to get you excited about unleashing your inner maker. In a previous video for this project, I showed you how I designed and built the core for this Rubik's Cube. I positioned six motors on all sides so that I could rotate the different sides of the cube. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to finish the project because my 3D printer failed and I ended up with a giant blob of PLA on the end of the nozzle. I I still need to finish printing all of the cubes and then I need to assemble the whole thing and then once I do that I need to write all of the code that allows me to scramble the puzzle and then once I set the puzzle down it'll unscramble and solve itself. I've run into a little bit of a problem here. These motor drivers have these green screw terminals on there. And in order to access those, I'll need to put the wires in from underneath. I think I've come up with a solution. On this motor driver, I've actually desoldered the screw terminals and I've turned them out 180 degrees. That way I can access the wires from this side. So now I just need to do that to the other two motor drivers. I love it when I'm doing a project like this and I come across a problem that I haven't encountered before. I'm going to be powering this whole thing using a battery, but I don't want it to be on all of the time, obviously. So this means that I need to install a power switch that needs to be accessible from the outside. The problem is, is that this whole thing is a bunch of moving parts. If I install a power switch on the center of this cube like this and just wire it to the battery, as this piece rotates, those wires are gonna get tangled up really quick. To solve this problem, I'm going to be installing what's called a slip ring. A slip ring is an electrical connection that has wires coming out of both ends, but it allows the wires to rotate without getting tangled up. I'm going to install a slip ring inside this puzzle so that the power button can rotate on the outside without tangling up all of the wires. I've got most of that wiring done, and as you might have noticed, I'm using a Teensy microcontroller for this project, and the main reason is because Arduino would not have enough digital I.O. pins for this project because each of the motors, I think, needs four pins, so four times six, that's 24 digital pins, and the Arduino doesn't have enough for that, so I'm gonna be using the Teensy 3.2, which has like 30-something digital I.O. pins, and all the pins are able to be used as interrupts, so that's awesome too. I've got the Teensy connected up to my computer, and I'm gonna start writing some code to get some of the motors moving. Here it goes, I just wrote some dead simple code to turn on the motor and spin it at a really low rate. Did you just see that? That broke when I pulled it off. Ugh, dang it. I'm gonna have to glue that back together. This is one of the motors that you saw me install in the last video. It's a 10 to 1 gear ratio, which means that I can back drive it by hand pretty easily, but it doesn't have quite enough torque to spin the cube on its own. If I spin up the motor like this, you can see that I can easily stop it with my hand. To solve this problem, I went ahead and I installed six new motors. These new motors that I've installed have a 75 to 1 gear ratio. This should be enough torque to rotate the assembled puzzle while still allowing me to rotate the center cubes to scramble the puzzle. Hopefully this solved my problem. I am so frustrated. 
I think it's been probably three or four weeks since the last time I recorded. Everything that could go wrong with this project has gone wrong. It turns out it's really hard to make a self-solving Rubik's Cube. I've burned up three teensy microcontrollers and at least three motor drivers. This is really frustrating because the teensy microcontrollers are like $25 each and I've burned up three of them. Fortunately, the motor controllers are only like two or three dollars each, but still that's adding up. I'm not sure what's causing these things to burn up, but I am so frustrated at this point. As far as I can tell, I think the problem is happening when I have the code switch directions of the motor. When this motor is rotating clockwise, for example, and I have the code immediately switched to counterclockwise, there's a big spike of current, and I think that spike of current is overpowering the protection diodes in the motor controller, and it's burning up the motor controller and actually making its way to the microcontroller as well. It has to do with how H-Bridge motor drivers work and the fact that I'm controlling it using pulse width modulation. And when I change directions, I have to invert the pulse width modulation. Anyway, it's kind of a more complex topic that I want to go into in this video, but hopefully there's a simple solution to this. All I need to do is add in a little bit of a delay when I change directions in my code. This should allow the motor to have enough time to change directions and not cause that big current spike. I'm really apprehensive to even move forward on this thing. I'm like kind of stuck in this analysis paralysis. If I hook something up, I'm really worried about burning up another expensive microcontroller. I'm not sure what to do at this point. I have spent dozens and dozens of hours on this project. I've printed all of these parts and I've blown up several microcontrollers at this point. If I can't figure out how to solve this problem, I'm gonna be in real trouble. I've ordered replacement parts, I've ordered more teensy microcontrollers and more motor drivers, but instead of hooking those up and possibly blowing up more parts, I think I'm gonna change directions here. I love using the Arduino platform because it's so cheap. And while I can't use that in the real project because it doesn't have enough pins, I can certainly use it to prototype and to troubleshoot some of these problems that I'm having. I have a whole bunch of these little Arduino nano boards and they're only a couple dollars each. So if I blow them up, it's not as big of a deal. I think my plan moving forward is to substitute the expensive Teensy microcontroller for one of these little cheap Arduino boards so that I can solve the problem, get it working fine, and then I'll put in the expensive microcontroller. Before we get too far into this project, I want to tell you about the sponsor of this video, and that's Altium. If you're like me, you're constantly working on projects that involve electronics. Maybe you're making an Arduino project, or maybe a Raspberry Pi project, or some sort of IoT thing, or maybe you're making a robot. You're going to need a circuit board for that project. And in order to design that PCB, you're going to want to use a reliable PCB design software, and that's why I'm recommending Altium Designer. What I like about Altium Designer is that it's an all-in-one platform. That means that you don't have to open up separate programs to do your schematic capture or your component selection or your board layout and your netlist generation. It's all in one platform. If you want to get serious about making PCBs, there's a link in the description where you can get a free trial of Altium Designer. When you download that free trial of Altium, you're also going to discover one of the other features that I like, and that's Altium 365. Altium 365 is a cloud workspace that allows you to save your project files in the cloud. Cloud. That means that you can collaborate with other people, you could work on various machines without losing your work. A whole team of engineers can be collaborating and reviewing the same project because it's cloud-based. So here's what you need to do. Go down in the description and click on the link and that will give you a free trial to Altium Designer. You're going to install it and open it up and start playing around with it and start placing components and then routing your traces and you're going to see how easy it is to use. After you're done playing around with the trial, you're going to go back in the description and click on the second link, which will give you a 30% discount when you decide to buy a license. Thank you for supporting sponsors like Altium, and thank you to Altium for supporting my channel. As I got all of this assembled, my worst fears were realized. The motors that I installed to replace the old ones still don't have quite enough torque to rotate all of the pieces after it's been assembled. You know what though, the lesson learned here is that sometimes my first attempt at ideas like this will result in total failure, and that's okay. This project is going to go on the shelf for now, and maybe I'll revisit it in the future. 
If you have any ideas on what I should have done differently to get this to work, I'd love to hear about them down in the comments.